Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. At whatever time you're viewing this broadcast, welcome. You know what time it is. I'm in my office today enjoying quiet time of reflection and meditation, thinking about the annual men's day that we're having here at Clifford Temple on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. You're invited 2007 Smith Avenue here in Thomasville, Georgia. But I'm just reflecting on the grace of God, the goodness of God. As we continue our Sunday school lesson, which deals with the fact that God's law is love. And we really got to get a handle on that. And our Sunday school lessons continue to lead us toward that conclusion. And when we say God's law is love, we're talking about God gave the Old Testament Ten Commandments covenant law out of love for his people. And the fact that now that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law, the Old Testament, we now live out of the love that God has shown to us through the grace of Jesus Christ, by offering up Jesus as the propitiation for our sins. And so this uh, Sunday school quarter, this Sunday school series of lessons all have to do with the resounding statement that God is love. Our lesson this week is entitled Works and Faith taken from Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 as devotional reading, and then chapter 2, verses 11 through 21 as the printed text. I invite you to read the entirety of chapter 2. I believe it will illustrate clearly that God's law is love. So we're going to talk about works and faith in terms of living by the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, and living by faith in Jesus Christ. Is there a difference? Does it matter? Are they the same? Well, let's get into the lesson. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We bless you and we magnify you. We acknowledge that there is none like you. We declare that thou art the one true and living God. And for that, we say thank you. We're excited about who you are and about your revelation of yourself to us. So we bless you, O God. And we bless the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, through the Holy Spirit revealed to us as your son. We accept Jesus as the way the truth, and the light. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Beloved, let's get into this text. Works and faith, beginning in Galatians chapter 2, reading the printed text at verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, which is another name for the Jews. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation or their hypocrisy or they're setting themselves now apart from the Gentiles, whereas before they were eating and drinking and living with the Gentiles in peace and harmony. But when the Jews arrived, uh, it caused them to stray from the truth of the gospel. Let's go to verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, According to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live 
as do the Jews. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Wow, Paul did not pull Peter to the side. Paul confronted Peter in the presence of everyone. I call it a teaching moment. Normally, we would want to pull people to the side when we see them doing wrong. But if their wrongdoing results in other people joining them, then that's a teachable moment. Not only did Peter withdraw from the Gentiles, so did the other Jews who were there with Paul and the other members of the congregation here in uh, uh, Antioch. Then it's a time for everyone to learn you need to change your behavior. So why say it twice when you can say it once? <laughs> but verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ. We ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. You hear that? I am crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Our lesson last week, we learn uh, conclusively that the law no longer is our tutor, that we have been saved by faith in that one act of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that the law, we, since we are dead to the law because Christ died, we died with Christ. And because Christ rose, we rose with Christ and we are now living on the other side of the cross, which means we have been set free from bondage of any sort, of any kind to live in covenant with our God. And so now we are understanding what uh, this lesson is teaching us at the beginning. But I wanna share the introduction to this lesson. It's entitled More Than Doctrine. I think it's worth sharing, and I hope you'll be patient with me at this hour. Here's what it reads in your commentary. Like many 18-year-olds, I thought I knew everything. I was a first-year Bible college student with a group of young, zealous, and like-minded guys who were dedicated to our doctrines. And anyone who disagreed with us was simply wrong. With a sense of superiority, we would often debate others in the dorms about their understandings of the particulars of Christian doctrine. Our statements and actions belittled anyone who came from a different Christian tradition. They were not like us. So we marginalized them. At lunch one day, a friend of mine was nettling one of our opponents. A professor of ours stepped in with firmness and truth. Our professor told my friend that he was not representing Christ. That's important. I just said something important. The author just wrote something important in this illustration. He said, with firmness and truth, our professor told my friend that he was not representing Christ. I stood there in fear and humility 
knowing that I too was receiving this correction. Our arguments over doctrines did not further the gospel in this case. They served as a dividing line between us and them. Our lesson today cuts to the heart of a similar issue faced by Peter and Paul. And so it is the law of love is more than doctrine. It is praxis. The law of love is greater than our understandings. It is our practice. It is not just mental assent. It is praxis. I want to say that until it rings in your head. They will know we are disciples by our love in action, not in words. Our words and actions should line up to reflect and represent Jesus the Christ in the earth. And so then here Paul is writing, he's writing to the church of Galatia, reminding them of certain events and experiences that they've had with Jews. Jews who believe that the law is still supreme, even after Christ has risen from the dead and is, is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And so Paul uh, did not address this letter to a particular church. He addressed it to a certain province, somewhere around what we call now modern Turkey. He is writing to address the discrimination, if you will, the supremacist attitudes of the Jews toward the Gentiles. He is writing to illuminate the difference and to teach the truth where there is error in the Jews thinking concerning the Gentiles. And he is speaking to not only the people, but he is speaking to the apostles, the leaders of the Jewish Christian family. Okay, you can hearken back to, to uh, several years after the Council of Acts 15, which is somewhere the author says around uh, AD 51, the year of our Lord 51. So that would be if, if Jesus lived until the year of our Lord 33, that would be about 33 from 51, about 20 years or so uh, after Jesus's resurrection and the beginning of the early church. And so Paul is writing an account. He's sharing an experience, but he's doing it to teach a lesson to the present churches in that province, in that area, and whoever would read this letter. He's very, very firm in his approach in this letter. He does not want to sugarcoat because it's too important. God's law is love. It trumps everything else. Nothing else that we stand on is equal to standing on the fact that God is love. And that reminds us that no matter how astute we may be in doctrine and in, in knowledge, love is the superior ethic because God is love. So then, here we come to Paul talking about Peter and the Jews that had been with him on this journey, this missionary journey, living with Gentiles, functioning every day as a believer in Jesus Christ. And then a group of Jewish leaders come from uh, Jerusalem to visit. They come to Antioch. What's Antioch? Antioch was the capital city of Syria in Paul's day. And it was somewhere where the church was scattered, the believers departed. And then when the church commissioned Paul and Barnabas, you remember in Acts 13, 
they went to Antioch. Peter came and Peter stayed with them and he joined in with the Gentiles as brothers and sisters in the faith. And now Paul saw something in Peter that you could say harken back to Acts 10 when God sent Peter to Cornelius' house. Peter went there with his Jewish racism, if you will, discrimination, slander, opinion about Cornelius, who was a worshiper of God but did not know Jesus. And Peter was saying that, that Jews really shouldn't be with the Gentiles because of their uncleanness before God, because they were not of the chosen tribe. And so God had to discipline Peter. And here again, Peter now, you remember Peter, same stubborn, mule-headed Peter, cussing Peter, that same individual, here they're having to discipline him once again. And so then we can say without doubt that Paul needs to confront Peter because the stakes are high. Listen to verse 12, verse 11 and 12. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, when it says that certain men who came from James, he's talking about those leaders who stayed in Jerusalem, the apostles, because they did not scatter with the people. So then these are leaders in the church who have come from Jerusalem that Peter is now gravitating toward, not wanting them to know that he has been uh, living by faith and not by the law. And he did that as a leader because he and Paul and Barnabas were the leaders of this teaching mission this evangelistic thrust. Listen to verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him in so much that Barnabas also was carried away by away with their dissimulation. They were all being hypocrites now. Why? Because some Jews came from Jerusalem who they thought were more important, who they wanted to please who they wanted to, to elevate above those that they had been sharing with all this time. Have you ever heard or seen somebody who was your friend in certain places, but then when they got around other people, they shunned you, separated from you as if your friendship was no longer valuable? They wouldn't come sit with you because of the presence of those they esteem more highly than you. That's what's going on. And so then even Barnabas, whose names mean encourager, son of consolation, comfort. Barnabas is supposed to be a, a, a mediator, an entreater, someone who encourages everybody, an exhorter, someone who would just uplift everyone. And here Barnabas is now joining Peter in this hypocrisy. Wow, that's awesome. And it disturbed Paul to the fact that Paul says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Who are we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles? 
He says, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews when you already know that they have been saved by faith, that they have been given grace through their faith in Jesus Christ, that they are accepted in the beloved, that they are on equal footing with us. And now you're trying to create some dissonance, some disharmony between the family of God, giving special privileges to the Jews. There is no special treatment required, no special treatment required for the Jews. Now I would speak to the situation in the Palestinians and the, the Israelis, but it would take too much time. But what the Bible teaches is there is no special distinction among the family of God. We're all beloved in the family of God. And so then when people quote their favorite text, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If you do, there's a blessing, blah, blah, blah. They are ignoring the historical precedences of the establishment of, of that state called Israel. And we must be students of history and see the results of conquest by colonial powers. See how the earth was divided when the Suez Canal was constructed. See how the end of World War II saw the introduction of the Jewish state. Listen, we need to be mindful that Palestinian Christians and Jewish Christians are, are encouraged, commanded to love one another without distinction based on the law. And so our lesson is talking about uh, works and faith. Is that right? Now, what is the work of the law? It is to be circumcised on the eighth day. It is to regard the feast uh, that the Lord God instituted when he delivered the people of Israel from Egypt, when he brought them in the promised land and all of the uh, 10 commandments and the 300 plus, maybe even 600 plus commandments that the uh, rabbis used to explain the Ten Commandments as if explaining the Ten Commandments required so many additional amendments to the law. And so then we're not getting into all that today, but those are the works of the law. The works that Paul is talking about, the not eating or touching anything unclean, associated with anything unclean. So when the Jews separate themselves, they are once again saying that the Gentiles are unclean. They may be saved, but they're unclean because they are not Jews. They don't follow Jewish food customs. They eat what they want to eat when they want to eat it. They do what they want to do based upon their own culture, but they love Jesus and they love one another. But the Jews now are disassociating themselves, trying to distinguish and make themselves superior to the Gentile Christians. And they're doing that in a way to say to the Gentiles, your faith is in vain if you don't practice the food uh, laws that we have, kosher foods, if you don't practice our feast and our uh, just assimilate into our culture, do it our way, then God is not honoring you. And that, my brothers and sisters, is hypocrisy. Why is it? Listen to verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified justified. Paul said, we know better. You know better, do better. You're not saved based on those customs and rites and traditions of Jewish law. You know that you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You know the gospel. So why are you now 
leaving the gospel that you have been living by with these Gentiles to go now and reconnect with the Jews who live by the law. You're making matters worse in your own life because you are now elevating the law above what Jesus did on the cross. And you are not going to be justified. Justified simply means that you are not going to be declared innocent by God because you are trying to keep the law. You be judged by the law, which puts you now in a worse condition than being judged by the faith you have in Jesus Christ. Your reliance on the law and your obedience to the law is not sufficient for you to be made righteous, which means in right standing with God. It is by faith through grace that you have been saved and no law trumps the law of love. Listen to verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. What is he talking about? This is absurd. What do you mean Christ is a minister of sin? It is that now you are making the law the standard for you to be judged by God. And if Christ is your Lord and Savior, then that means Christ is what? Ruling over the law, which the law produces and reveals, as we taught on last week, and exposes sin. Why would you go from the higher to the lower, from the greater to the less? Read Hebrews chapter 7. Why would you return, if you will, as Hebrews says, unto your own vomit? Why would you subject yourself to a law that is ineffective to produce salvation when you have what you need in Jesus Christ? And Jesus is not going to be judging anyone based on the law. Here it is, verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. 19, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Paul's laying it on thick here. And then he makes the, the ultimate statement of faith. Listen, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is God's law of love in a nutshell. It is in Christ that we live and move and have our very being. It is through Christ that we live. We, we are taught by grace. We live by grace. Listen, everything is based on what Jesus did on Calvary Cross. And what did he do? The veil in the temple was ripped in twain because it divided the holy from the profane. It divided the people from their God. Now the, the veil has been ripped. We all now have access into this grace by faith in Jesus Christ. You can come to God at any time, whosoever will, whensoever he or she wills, can enter into the presence of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Not discounting the law, but not counting the law as a requirement for you to enter into the presence of God. It is by faith. We trust and we rely on what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. We are dead to the law. We don't have to live by those Jewish customs. And so then when you try to straddle the fence, jump back and forth, sometimes you blame yourself, sometimes you confess your sins, sometimes you're guilty, sometimes you are set free by the Holy Spirit. Listen, you got to stay on one side of the issue. Either you're going to live by the law, which ultimately means 
you will not measure up to what God intends or you'll live by faith, which means the sky is the limit. There's really no limit. I was using the illustration, which means you can go as soar as high as the eagle, do great things in the world because you don't hold yourself guiltless. Neither do you hold yourself guilty. You leave it in the hands of the Lord. Paul said it like this, judge nothing before the time. He says, I don't even judge myself because I could be wrong in my own estimation. I leave all that to Jesus and I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Press by faith. Don't ever allow sin to hold you back. Don't ever allow people to tell you what you can and cannot do. Press your way through by your faith in Jesus the Christ. Well, I've got to end this. Look at Paul in verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Did you hear that? If you can be saved and right with God based on how you keep the law, then why would Jesus have to die for something you could have done on your own? Come on, somebody. That's one of the arguments today. What did Jesus save you from? He saved you from yourself, your self-image, your self-worth, all the, the things that you think you are that don't give you right standing with God, that cannot empower you to live without sin, Jesus saved you from that. And it is by his sacrifice that we are now set free to live in covenant with God. God's law is love. That's why we sing the hymn, love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but the master of the sea Heard my despairing cry. Now saved am I. And so then, beloved, don't be a hypocrite. Jesus hung out with sinners, tax collectors, publicans, the least, the left out, the rejected. They criticized him. They thought he was just, you know, just so wrong because he didn't hang out with that religious crowd that thought they were more holier than thou. It's okay to have friends. It's okay to have associates, good people that you can witness to, eat dinner with, share life with, but still be a witness and not try to act superior to them, but see them eye to eye as human beings. But when they ask you a reason, for the hope that lies within you, listen, my brothers and sisters, it's not because I belong to a Masonic Lodge. It's not because I belong to a sorority that I'm the way I am. It's not because I, believe I belong to a frat that I'm the way I am. I am who I am by faith in the Son of God. And if it had not been the Lord on my side, all of these other things that have enhanced my ability to live a moral, decent, disciplined life would be nothing. And I don't rest. I don't hang my sword on the racks of the law. But it's by faith in the grace of Jesus to Christ. It was at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. Beloved, enjoy this lesson. See where you stand. Are you relying on your goodness or are you relying on the gospel for your salvation? God bless you today. Thank you for joining in. If you would, I pray that you would like this video, 
share it with those you love the most and those you may not love so much. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Let's keep this connection, this relationship going from week to week. Listen, God has a word with your name on it. Let's stay together. That's what Al Green would say. Let's stay together. Amen. And let us build up one another. We grow by lifting each other up, not by pulling each other down. God bless you. Listen, we'll see you if you're in the Thomasville area or nearby. Come to Clifford Temple for our annual Men's Day service at 2 p.m. Or come for our morning service where yours truly will be preaching at 11 a.m. We want you to come join us in person or on Facebook Live, Clifford Temple, CME Church, Thomasville. Listen, we want to be an important part of your discipleship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for our time around your word today. We ask you to bless those who are listening to this message. We're asking uh, us to understand, oh God, that there is no divisions, no schisms, no isms that should be in the body of Christ. Help us to eradicate them all through our love, the way that we represent and reflect your love in the earth. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll see you next week. God be with you. Amen. Hallelujah.